Assalamualaikum and peace be upon you. My name is Sharik Abdul Ghani and I am the director of Minaret Foundation where our focus is to lift American Muslim voices for sustainable change through multi-faith and civic engagement. Joining me today, we have Pastor Chris Hall. Good uh, afternoon, everybody. Thank you, uh, Shark, for uh, inviting me into the conversation. Looking forward to uh, hearing what Dr. Olofsson has to say today. And, and Pastor Chris is a friend of mine, and he's the Outreach and Missions Director for Houston Northwest Church. That's uh, correct, yeah, yeah. Which is in Dr. Tom Oliverson's district, uh, and Dr. Tom Oliverson is running for House uh, House uh, District 130, uh, and he has joined us today as part of our weekly candidate Q&A series, uh, where we engage and discuss uh, politics and issues with our candidates running for office. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Oliverson. Thank you, Sharik. I appreciate it. And hello to all my friends out there. It's good to be with you today. This is actually the second time you've joined us bef uh, because yeah. before you joined us on a webinar with Imam Walid Basuni on faith and politics, and that's something that we're going to get we're going to get to towards the end of our uh, end of our conversation to today. Um, Tom, could you start us off with your key platform issues? Yeah, sure. So, Sharik, uh, this is running. I'm running for my third term. Um, I have sort of picked up the mantle as one of uh, two physicians in the Texas House. Uh, the last couple of sessions, uh, a major focus for me has been healthcare affordability. Uh, and we've taken several steps over the last sessions to try to work on that. Uh, in the past, we have passed legislation to ban surprise medical bills. Um, you know, to, to help uh, or hold, I, said, I should say, our freestanding emergency rooms to be more accountable and transparent in the way that they're uh, describing their network status and prices to patients so that people can understand what they're getting into. Uh, we also passed legislation last session uh, to uh, essentially put a limit on the future growth of prescription drug prices. Uh, and then one that's gotten a lot of attention lately, especially with the Supreme Court and what's going on with the Affordable Care Act, is we actually did pass legislation last session, Sharik, that uh, would protect Texans from losing access to insurance uh, with pre-existing conditions. That, you know, in the event that something happens to the ACA, that Texas is prepared to step in and make sure that, no, that people don't lose access to insurance. So. Um, that's something we've worked on moving forward into this session. I think we're going to really tackle the uninsured population um, and really looking at it through the lens of uh, affordability uh, and making sure that, you know, I think we have a growing problem, not just in Texas, but throughout this country where we have we have health care providers and we have health care insurance. And then we have a growing population that is not able to access either because costs are prohibitive. Uh, and so trying to look at ways to bend that cost curve down for everyone um, so that people can get access to the care that they need uh, at prices that they can afford, you know. Um, and so that's going to be a big thing. I would say, you know, I keep hearing things coming out of Austin, you know, with the coronavirus pandemic. Um, it's not 100 percent clear to me what we will really have a chance to do next session. Um, there been, has been much talk that it may be a fairly limited session. Of course, we have redistricting coming up. And so that's always something that must be done. Uh, but even because of the coronavirus pandemic, we won't be able to get to redistricting until next summer because we won't get the data back from the federal government until after our session, a regular session would be completed. Uh, of course, you know, we will have a budget and there's going to be a bit of a shortfall. I'm sure you've probably heard about that. I imagine most folks that are listening are aware that uh, oil prices uh, are down, um, sales tax revenues are down, uh, and so we have a bit of a shortfall. How much we don't, we won't know until we get there. But we'll be needing to figure out uh, how to manage that. And one of the things that I've been pretty clear about is um, I was very proud of the educational achievements from last session and the increases in education funding that we were able to provide um, as a doctor, as a, a product of, a, of the public school system here in Harris County. I believe very strongly that knowledge is power um, and we must do everything we can to ensure 
that those uh, educational gains were not a one session thing. I mean, I voted for those increases as permanent ongoing funding changes to make sure that we were doing all we could to equip young people in our district and throughout the state to have a fair and equitable education system. Uh, so that's a priority is to figure out how to make sure we keep those promises. Um, and then I think, you know, one of the other things that we have to turn our eye to uh, with regards to, again, with this pandemic, I think there's two issues that have sort of arisen. One is sort of a general look at um, best practices in terms of public health and how we're handling and how we're prepared for and what lessons did we learn from this particular crisis that could be applied to future pandemics. And that's everything from, you know, are our county health departments properly resourced and prepared so that when something hits the streets, they can do testing and they can roll that out without having to wait on the feds um, or federal dollars to be able to do that. To something as simple as when we look at how a degree a disease is progressing in a population, are we really getting the right data? Are we looking at the right things? You're probably aware that as this pandemic has gone on, our, our way of actually getting a handle on it in terms of the data we look at, whether it's people who've been exposed or hospitalizations or ventilators, it's become a much of a moving target. So I think we need better, uh, more standardized ways to look at these things uh, so that we can get an idea of how we're doing. Um, and then finally, just say that, you know, I think that uh, we're going to be looking at that chapter of, of governmental code that speaks to uh, disaster powers for chief executives um, and their role in managing these things. I think when those chapters were designed, they were designed for hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, wildfires. They were not designed for nine months and counting of, you know, partial shutdown, um, sort of not giving the people's representatives a chance to weigh in. You know, in this state, uh, the legislature has no authority to call itself into session. Um, we can only come in to session during a regular session or upon a special session upon the governor's call. Um, and so, you know, I've heard from a lot of constituents that, you know, this is many months ongoing of things. And, you know, we may or may not agree with every decision that's been made at the county level or the city level or the state level, um, but here we are powerless to say anything or do anything about it. The chief executives have all the power. I don't think that's necessarily how our system was designed. So we'll have to take a look at that and see what needs to be done to make that more of a representative government. So those are some things. You started us off in your conversation to, with us about healthcare. And that's actually the first issue we wanted to jump in. And for clarity's sake, I'm gonna ask you a few of the questions that you've already answered. But feel free to feel free to answer again, and perhaps even in a different manner. Um, and I, I, as a physician, you know that for decades, healthcare costs in the United States have risen faster than the rate of inflation. And amidst yeah. the increase, thirty percent of healthcare spending is estimated to be unnecessary. What policy solutions do you support to address the rising costs of healthcare? And could you already and could you speak to what you've already done? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question, Sharik. And, and just briefly to review. So we have done several things in the last two sessions since I've been in the legislature to try uh, to bend this cost curve down or at least sort of, um, you know, sort of stem the hemorrhaging, if you will, to borrow a medical term, put a tourniquet on that. Um, you know, the, the getting rid of the surprise medical bills, I think, is a huge achievement. Uh, you may or may not be aware that uh, Texas was able to solve this in uh, one uh, session. Uh, of the legislature last session, the federal government has been working on the same problem since basically before we uh, entered into our legislative session in January of 2019, and they're still working on it. Here it is the end of 2020. They may have finally reached a compromise. Um, and lo and behold, it looks like what we passed here in Texas. Uh, mm. And so we got it done and we did it the right way. Uh, and the key there was to get the patient out of the middle you have a billing dispute in an out-of-network situation that arises because a provider and an insurer have not been able to reach an agreement about fair market value. That is not the patient's fault, uh, especially in a situation where the patient had no ability to choose a provider ahead of time because it was an emergency or because they were a hospital-based provider 
or because it was some sort of lab or imaging study that was ordered for them. Um, they're put in a situation where as a consumer, they had no power to choose to go a different way. And yet oftentimes they were left holding the bag um, to the tune of thousands of dollars of, of basically unmet costs and charges. So we got the patient out of the middle uh, and we basically said, look, um, providers, plans, this is y'all's problem. You will get together in a, a sort of a safe space supervised by the Department of Insurance and you'll work it out. Um, and we'll give them some tools, some market-based indicators of what that fair market value would be. And, uh, and we'll let you work it out. And so far that's working very, very well. Uh, it's been in action now uh, for about nine months. Uh, and in that time, consumer complaints for surprise medical bills have dropped by 95%, Sharik. So, I mean, a, a very successful strategy. Uh, I want to specifically talk about, which I think is really the, where we go from here, which is the cost thing. You mentioned the costs. Yes, right. the costs in healthcare are insane. Um, makes very little sense. Uh, and look, as a provider and also as a policymaker, uh, I can tell you with 100% certainty that the main driving factor in all of that is the fact that unlike every other sector of the economy, Healthcare works with a total lack of transparency where patients are unable, consumers are unable to determine the costs and use their own smart economic behavior uh, to decide where to go. They can't figure these things out until long after the care is provided. Mm -hmm. Imagine for a second if we purchased cars the way we purchase healthcare and you wouldn't know what you paid for that car until two months after you started driving it. But at that moment, the bill became due and you were expected to pay. I mean, and that's a terrible way to, to do things. So one of the things that I will push for very strongly, um, and you saw the, the uh, president has, has been pushing on this as well. He signed an executive order on price transparency in June of last year. Um, and it's made its way through the courts and it's been upheld as being a legitimate and um, you know, constitutional thing. Uh, we want patients to be able to know what costs are going to be for healthcare services before they have to take those services, right? If it's something they could shop for, we want them to know in advance what the cost will be so that if they have a choice of going to two different hospitals for a procedure, I think it's fair and appropriate that they should be able to comparison shop. They should know what their out-of-pocket cost would be before they ever darken the doors of, of that of either facility. Right. I think that is the number one way that we drive costs down in this country is we actually start treating the healthcare industry like we treat every other sector of this economy and we have upfront conversations about price and quality. Uh, and I think that would dramatically that? lower costs. Could you, could you tell us a little bit more about what you've done for the issue revolving around or policy revolving around pre-existing conditions. You had mentioned yeah. earlier that should ACA be overturned and, and God, I hope it's not overturned. Um, I hope at least we have something better in place uh, before let's say it is overturned, something to improve. It, it was a starting point and it definitely needs to be improved upon, but should ACA be defeated in the courts? Um, you had mentioned that you had worked okay. on uh, bipartisan bipartisan policy regarding pre-existing conditions. Could Correct. you enlighten us? Uh, so mm -hmm. that yeah. So Senate Bill 1940 was passed last session in the in the uh, 2019 session, uh, and it basically uh, gives the insurance commissioner uh, without the legislature having to meet. So this was designed. Keep in mind, this was designed uh, in 2019 in preparation that if something were to happen to the ACA, then Texas would be prepared. We wouldn't have to have a special session right away, that it would already sort of be there, uh, break glass in case of emergency, and there you go. Uh, so basically it creates and reauthorizes uh, a risk pool so that people who may not be able to get coverage uh, through the marketplace uh, of commercial insurance providers, you know, in other words, they were turned away because they had too many pre-existing conditions, um, that there would be a place that would be subsidized and paid for um, 
you know, in part by the state and in part uh, through, uh, you know, premiums uh, uh, that they would be able to get affordable health care coverage. So they would not have to be without. So it it really closes the loop on that one thing. You mentioned the importance of the ACA. The thing that I find that the vast, vast majority of Americans and Texans agree uh, that the ACA does is it provides that protection for people with pre-existing conditions. Uh, And so Texas has already taken steps to be prepared. Now, as it turns out, you know, as the days are waning here, it's likely that if something were to happen, um, we we will be in session very shortly, uh, you know, in in a matter of a couple of months. And so we will also have the ability to weigh in. Uh, so, but I just want everybody to know that we we were out there in front. We recognized the danger, and we took steps to make sure that Texans would be protected. Chris, yeah, thanks so much. So, um, being a, a, a growing up in the area, um, seeing um, you know. The community change and, and culture change um, in a number of ways. Um, I think if it weren't for healthcare, the next issue that everybody is is concerned about talking about is education. Uh, my wife is a elementary school teacher. I've got two children in, currently in school, um, and um, that that is something that many in our community are are asking about. Um, Unfortunately, though, it's 50 percent more likely that a student arrested in high school will will drop out before graduation. So many high school students are arrested due to misconduct. Um, These arrests are often referred to as the Mm. the school to prison pipeline. So can you just maybe one concrete step or a policy you would take to combat this this uh, school? to prison? Yeah, I think that's great, Chris. so that is a complex issue. And I think that ultimately we have to do a better job of identifying these folks earlier um, and figuring out what we can do to sort of engage them in the educational process and making sure that they have the resources necessary. This is one of the things that we looked at last session uh, with regards to mental health, um, you know, sort of in response to the tragedies that had happened um, in some of our, you know, in our schools, um, I'm unfortunately blanking on the name here, which I shouldn't be, but, uh, but, you know, unfortunately we had a, a pretty high profile school shooting. And so we, we spent a fair amount of time. I'm sorry. Down in Santa Fe. Yes, that's right. That's right. Santa Fe. Is it down, Santa Fe you're talking my, about? Uh, in my, uh, my colleague, Greg Bonin's district. And so we spent a fair amount of time looking at some of these issues. Um, and realizing that, you know, some of these young, young uh, people, some of these kids that are, that are troubled, um, you know, they're sort of there and they're troubled and there's no process and there's no way. I mean, one of the things that was fascinating uh, to me and just sort of like a red flag uh, per se was that, you know, in talking with some of these teachers and coaches that had interacted with this young man, Um, Everybody knew something was wrong, but nobody really, there was no process, there was no method, there was no, um, you know, way to actually get help or to intervene or to actually do anything. And people were afraid from the school standpoint to say anything. So it's sort of like they don't want to, you know, say, well, this kid's a troubled kid and then maybe that ends up getting them in trouble, right? So there was no real process. And this is one of those problems you have uh, where everybody knows something's wrong um, and there's no process in place as to how one's gonna deal with a situation like that and who's ultimately gonna be responsible for making that decision and identifying what the problem is and how to get that person help. And it's kind of one of these, everybody sees the problem, but everybody's afraid to speak up and do something about it. Uh, and so I think one of the things that we can do with regards to what you talked about with the school to prison pipeline is we got to do a better job of identifying these kids ahead of time um, before it gets to that point. And we have to find ways to redirect them uh, into the positives of, of education and the upward mobility that it brings. You know, as I said, knowledge is power. Um, there's got to be something better. 
uh, for these young folks than, you know, turning to criminal activity or, you know, joining a gang or whatever it is that gets them down that pathway into the wrong, you know, the wrong pipeline, I'd say. So, so there's many factors in the school to prison pipeline. It's a, a, as you had mentioned, uh, Tom, that it's it's a very complex and it's and we know it's a very nuanced issue. It's not a one size fits all solution, and it's not a one size fits all problem. Um, some of the some of the policy positions that have been put out there, uh, not just in our state, but states like New Mexico, uh, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, even Florida, for that matter have identified small ways, low hanging fruit to disrupt the school to prison pipeline. Part of which is just simple policy proposals such as we won't put children in handcuffs. A seven year old has no business. We don't need children sized handcuffs. Um, not suspending children who are in second, first in pre-K, K, first grade, or second grade, because we know that there's a direct conduit between children who are suspended, then they get suspended again, straight into the juvenile justice system. Small common sense issues, such as counseling, not criminalization, providing them yeah. with opportunities to vent and to talk about issues that are happening at home or in their neighborhood or in society around them that is causing this type of disruptive behavior. A second grader or third grader isn't born saying, or doesn't come out saying, hey, I wanna take a knife to school today. Or, or says that I really want to beat up this kid because he looked at me the wrong way. There's something deeper happening there. Correct. Right. right. And, and it's likely, or it could be at least, that it's not even happening at the school, right? Right. I mean, this is one of the unfortunate situations that I think a lot of times our teachers, our administrators, our counselors find themselves in is that, you know, it may be in some of these circumstances that the four walls of the classroom is literally the most constructive environment that that child has access to. Um, and we got to figure out how to better empower those folks. I, I think one of the other things, and this is maybe the other side of the coin, I don't know, but because uh, we've talked about this in the legislature as well, is that we need, um, we need to stand with our teachers and our educators and our administrators when it comes to, you know, uh, basic classroom management and discipline. Um, we can't be constantly faulting the teachers and saying that, well, you can't, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't say this, you can't take that step. I mean, I, I talk to a lot of teachers, who, you know, I, I have a lot of educators in my family as well. My brother-in-law and sister-in-law teach uh, in uh, Barber's Hill, and my sister, um, my, my only sibling, is an art teacher for the Department of Defense. She's taught uh, our military kids overseas for more than a decade. And, you know, they can't be left alone to figure this out. I mean, my brother-in-law tells me, you know, situations in, in his past where he's reported things to administration about students being threatening to him. And they basically responded by saying, well, unless he has a specific plan to do bodily injury and has evidence of a weapon, we don't want to hear about it. You mm -hmm. figure it out. I mean, that is not a good solution. We've got to stand with our educators and give them the tools to sort of nip these things, you know, before they get to that point, right? right? Um, so, so it is a complex issue, right? On one hand, we want to be supportive and we want to intervene early and we want to help these, these youngsters, especially if perhaps the problem may not necessarily be what's going on at school that's troubling them. But at the same time, we've got to stand with our educators, too. We can't let them be run over. Um, and basically, because, you know, bad behavior reinforces bad behavior, right? Absolutely. My, my, mother is a, my mother was a teacher at Aleph ISD, not the easiest school district to be yeah. a teacher. And she's a career teacher, retired there. I think she did 21 or 22 years. And she has stories of teachers getting beat up by elementary school children. And they can't do anything because if they even lift a hand, they could be sent to, they could be sent to prison for assault on a minor. Um, so it, it, there has to be, there has to be, and any policy put forth has to be balanced. But I, I'm hearing this, you would be supportive of measures that would help eliminate or disrupt, at least disrupt the school to prison pipeline. Yeah, I'm very supportive of that. And look, I'm gonna, it, I'm gonna, it, you know, just sort of full disclosure. Um, I'm not personally not an educator, uh, and uh, but I listen to experts. And as a scientist, I 
I listen carefully to experts. I look at the data. I look at the studies. I evaluate carefully as a doctor. Uh, when I hear about a problem, from the moment I hear that problem, I'm gathering data. I'm diagnosing, you know, listening to the symptoms, uh, and I'm trying to ascertain what the problem is so that I can then come up with a treatment plan. That's just how I think. Uh, so it, it is a complex problem, um, but I'm all in, man. Uh, we need to obviously solve this. And speaking of the criminal justice system, moving on to our next issue. Um, last, uh, I believe it was either last week or the week before, we had Constable Trevor Nels. Uh, who's a constable right now in Fort Bend County, and he's running for on the Republican ticket for Fort Bend County Sheriff. Um, I sit on the mayor's police uh, reform task for mayor's task force for police reform, and one of the issues that is brought up time and time again is that an easy, low-hanging fruit on police reform that would just help out many of the major police chiefs in the state of Texas, mentioned by Chief Acevedo, Sheriff Gonzalez, and many others is that if an officer is dishonorably discharged, if an officer is fired from HPD, as of right now, as it stands according to TCOL rules in the state of Texas, they can be rehired in Plano or Dallas or Katy. Uh, and they yeah. have to be fired twice to have their peace officer license pulled. To put this into context, if you are dishonorably discharged from our military, whether you're a Marine or you, you're, you're in the Navy, you can never have a peace officer's license. It's just not doable. So one of the issues that Chief Acevedo and Sheriff Gonzalez and even Constable Nels had mentioned is this is an easy way to tackle police reform because it's the bad apples mm -hmm. that make our law enforcement, it gives them the, just that negative image and it's an easy way to remove the bad apples from the pool. Is this something that you would support? Yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, Sharik, I'm going to just say that that as a doctor, that seems very natural to me. You you may be aware that as a physician, uh, you know, you can go to the Texas Medical Board website and you can look me up uh, and it'll say my license number and you can find out if there's ever been any disciplinary action against me by the state. Uh, but even more so, there's the National Practitioner Data Bank that keeps a, a list of um, of actions by other states and malpractice cases and things like that. And that's all public record, right? And we've talked in, and I uh, believe we've also passed legislation from the standpoint of teaching, uh, same kind of thing. You know, if there's if there are issues um, that districts should be able to find out about that, you know, um, there, there obviously are sort of these employment concerns. But I think when you're in a position where your job is basically the role of public servant in one capacity and, or another, um, whether you're a police officer or an EMT or a doctor or a nurse or perhaps even a teacher, I think that the public should have a right to see that if, in fact, there were, you know, legitimate disciplinary actions taken against you, not, not you know, somebody complained about you on Yelp, you know, said you weren't very nice. I mean, that's not <laughs> what I'm talking about here. But I mean, something that actually went through a process. Uh, and was found to be valid and resulted in your termination or, you know, legal action being taken against you, then yeah, heck yeah. I mean, that I'm under that scrutiny all the time. Very refreshing, a, a, a database or, 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 or to make policing transparent. Yeah. To, uh, kind of going a different direction with this, Dr. Oliverson, uh, the, with this conversation um, about climate change. Um, just now, as we as we look at the um, impending hurricane threat with our neighbors towards the uh, towards the east in Louisiana, they've already gotten hit um, just a, a month or so ago. They uh, keep getting hit. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Unfortunately. We've seen a record number of hurricanes this hurricane season, is, and we know very well here in the Houston area uh, with Hurricane Harvey, the uh, the uh, difficult um, challenges that come up with that. And then we're also seeing fires in California, a number of other uh, disasters that um, scientists are, are relating to, to climate change. Um, recently, New Zealand's prime minister stated that by in the year 2030, New Zealand would be totally carbon neutral um, so 
can we maybe kind of talk on specific to Texas, one step you would take to work towards this direction? Um, what types of climate change reform would you consider um, to uh, it, for the futures uh, in uh, generations of, of our state? Well, Chris, that's a great question. Um, and let me just be completely honest with you that, you know, the, the, um, the climate change issue from my standpoint uh, ties directly back to the public education issue uh, because so much of our funding for public education derives from oil and gas revenues um, that any conversation about climate change, I think, has, in, you know, and what you're going to do as far as, you know, whether we're talking about banning fracking or, you know, encouraging renewable energy sources and, uh, you know, moving away from fossil fuels or any of these things that people talk about. I think all of that has to be couched with the idea that that uh, unless other measures are taken, you're jeopardizing education funding. Clearly, that's how we fund education in Texas. So Absolutely, yeah. The economy of fracking, then we're talking about defunding schools as well. Um, so I think you know um, that's a complicated issue. Um, one of the things that frustrates me is that um, you know there are places in the world that you can go where the carbon emissions are infinitely higher than what we face here in Texas. And they're not doing anything about that. And so, you know, yeah, I, I want to take it seriously from the standpoint of, I, I believe as a, as a Christian, I believe that, you know, uh, that God gave us dominion over the earth. And that means part of that is we should be good stewards of the earth, right? We shouldn't trash the place. Right. Sure. Uh, I, I would, I'm assuming you agree with me to, on that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with you on that point. And I, I've heard um, individuals share the same sentiment um, that God has given the earth to us as a gift. Um, and we are to, as the scripture states, to take dominion over it. Um, we, uh, we've been given natural resources um, to grow uh, and to be fruitful. Um, and like you said, we need to be be careful of what we've been given, uh, not take it for granted. Um, and uh, scientists appear to be sharing that some of the steps that we have taken as a society have um, caused um, climate change to go south um, and encouraging um, companies and businesses to go in another direction. Um, if, if we continue to see that kind of step um, towards cleaner climate um, and cleaner um, use of fossil fuels and, and other types of um, fueling the, the uh, community, um, whether it be wind or, or, or whatever, um, would you see a opportunity to uh, incentivize those kinds of directions? You know, again, the biggest concern I have with this is that it, this, again, the way that our public education system in particular is funded is so heavily mm -hmm. dependent on fossil fuels at this point um, that I'm concerned and I think legitimately should be concerned that, you know, if we're if we're doing things to basically uh, destabilize or disrupt or reduce um, our ability to produce natural gas and, and other oil products, um, that literally has a direct tangible effect on our classrooms. Uh, and until that particular issue is resolved, I think we got to be really, really careful about what, you know, to what lengths are we willing to go to uh, in order to address this. I'm not going to disagree with you that the climate is changing. Um, but again, I, I, when we talk about climate change, the one thing that, that as, a, as a conservative person that frustrates me is that we, and maybe this is just the limitation as humans that we have, is we can only do what's in front of us to do. Um, but it's one world, right? And so if we acknowledge that the climate is changing and, we, and, if, and if the belief is, is that that is a man-made phenomenon, um, then everybody has to be all in on that. We can't have one part of the world essentially penalizing itself uh, while another part of the world that may be developing is, is just massively polluting the environment. Um, in, you know, 
So, I mean, it just, I don't know just, if that that, just, just that we, we as Americans have a response. that would be very frustrating. The world. We sort of let China just be China, for example, and we don't hold them to any account, um, but we're willing to sort of handicap our own economy and jeopardize our education funding. Right. Which, I mean, it, it brings up it brings up an interesting issue that, that I, I was mentioning before, that we as Americans... As, as, as the city on a hill, we have a responsibility, the moral authority, I would say, to lead the way for the rest of the world to ensure that we are, we are living up to the best version of ourselves. But we're also we are also creating a model and example for the rest of the world to follow. Unfortunately, unfortunately or unfortunately, Europe has really taken away. Um, and, it's, and it's a mantle that I, I think myself and Chris and many others would like for America to, to retake. We should be the leading the way to save to save this planet that God has given us to be stewards, to be stewards over. And Islam, as Muslims, we believe the same thing. Um, we, we absolutely believe that God, that, that God has given us the earth as a gift. He's given it to us. And it's our responsibility to take care of it. And as you said, it's our responsibility not to trash it. And to a different angle of what you had said about the funding issue, it's you know, I, I think you would agree with me on saying that becoming independent of fossil fuels is a national security issue. It's in the long-term interest of our nation not to be reliant upon these despotic nations such as Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates or just all these other nations that don't hold the same values or the belief systems that we as Americans do. And then when we're able to capture our own energy needs, and to be more self-sufficient, it makes us as a nation far more secure and easily able to lead the way. Right. Um, so brings us to another issue of security, which is Islamophobia in all other in all other forms of hate. Um, since the past since the past four years, since two thousand and sixteen, for whatever reason we've seen a massive uptick um, as, as it relates to the Southern Poverty Law Center, the Anti-Defamation League, um, the, the Council on American Islamic Relations, NAACP, LULAC, all the civil rights organizations, they can definitely agree on one thing. There's been an uptick on hate crimes uh, in, in the past few years. Um, not just hate crimes, but incidents of bias as well. So you see issues in schools regarding school bullying. You see verbal uh, provocations out on the streets. Uh, you see things that happen at the cash registers, at our grocery stores, which are just gross. Um, what, what have you done to combat Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and all other forms of hate? And what do you plan on doing in the next legislative, legislative session? So I think one of the big things uh, from my perspective, Sharik, and I know you and I've talked about this before, is that uh, I think we're all people of the book, right? And, and I think the one thing that sort of unites uh, all of us, I think the United States as a country was founded upon the idea that um, in God we trust, right? And so the idea that a person uh, who is a citizen of this country uh, and is serving in this country as a in some capacity, just as a even but even as a citizen. I mean, there is some fundamental assumption on the part of our founding fathers that there is a divine component to that. There is an understanding of absolute right and wrong. If you look at our criminal justice system, there are things which are very much descended from you know the the history of our faiths. Um, that are basically on our understanding of right and wrong, right? And uh, and what I what I don't like that I see uh, in our country right now, in our politic in general, is that some folks feel the need to divide and conquer Americans and get people to think of themselves as, you know, not an American, but I'm of a particular group, and because I'm of a particular group, um, everybody outside of my group treats me differently. Um, and it's sort of this promotion of divisiveness from the standpoint of being able to sort of exploit that for political purposes. I don't look at people in that way, and, and I don't think you do either. I, I look at us all as being Americans. Um, I look at us all as being Texans. 
Um, and I cry as everyone else cries and I get angry as everyone else gets angry whenever injustice occurs. I simply don't stand for that. Um, and I'm deeply concerned that as we continue to sort of move to a culture of moral relativism, away from sort of a traditional understanding of right and wrong, that we run the risk of further marginalizing uh, religious communities and religious conservatives and even the ability to practice one's faith. Um, and we've talked about that. And so, you know, I'm going to continue to reach out to communities of faith because I think at this point it's all hands on deck. We all are in this together. Uh, I think there's a concerted effort on the part of some to deprioritize and delegitimize the importance of, of Almighty God and uh, and the importance of practicing your religious beliefs. Um, I have heard politicians speak and actually try to change the narrative from freedom of religion to freedom of worship, meaning, of course, that you know uh, you can do whatever you do inside your church, mosque, synagogue, but you better bring not bring that out into the public square, and that's wrong. Um, a person who has a belief in God and uh, lives a life according to you know, being in a God-centered universe, absolutely in this country is constitutionally guaranteed to walk out into the public square and proudly exercise that faith and know that the government's got, it, got their back in terms of protecting that free exercise thereof. And it's not about establishment or anti-establishment, it's about protecting the free exercise of religion. And I will always, always, fight for anyone uh, who is being, you know, intruded upon or, you know, shamed or, you know, uh, marginalized because their perspective is a perspective of um, God is the center of my universe and the way I conduct myself in my personal life and my business and just the way I interact with my peers is through that, that belief that I am not the center of my own universe, God is. Um, I'm going to fight to protect that every time. Dr. Oliver, kind of along those lines of um, the diversity in our faith, in our in our immediate community, um, we also see um, the, the diversity in cultures and communities from uh, around the world. In fact, I've, I've been told that Houston is maybe the most diverse city in the United States, certainly uh, of, uh, in our in our globe. Um, but as we think on the diversity of the United States, it remains just this talking point until we see it reflected in our, in our immediate relationships, uh, in our social circles, um, but also in our government. So would you talk about, um, what you would do to ensure, or what you currently are doing to, uh, keep diversity in all aspects of your, of your office? So in my particular office, my office is very diverse. Um, and Sharik's smiling because he knows this. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that the first ever Muslim chief of staff is my chief of staff in the Texas. First ever. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm very proud of that. Um, and uh, in last session, I will tell you in my office, uh, in terms of diversity, we had two men and three women. Uh, we had two Muslims, uh, two Christians, and one Jew. And so, you know, there's tremendous religious diversity um, in different ethnicities, different cultures represented, um, different genders. Uh, and, and look, the important thing there, Chris, is that didn't happen because I decided on some arbitrary government mandated formula. It happened because I believe very strongly in finding good people who are capable of doing the job. And that diversity just, it kind of came to be, it naturally came to be. I was not willing to sort of say, well, we're gonna exclude this person because we already have too many of that particular group or you know, we don't want their kind here or any of those kind of things. That kind of stuff really, really troubles me. Um, I believe very strongly in the diversity and we were able to achieve that and uh, we have achieved that for, for several sessions. Uh, my district director is Hispanic. Uh, she speaks Spanish as well as English. I'm one of the offices uh, in Harris County where if you are a constituent and you only speak Spanish and you need help, you can call my office even if you're not a, well, even if you're not a constituent, you call my office and my district director, Grace, will will assist you in English or Spanish anytime you need. That's wonderful. Um, 
Certainly, as we have looked at your district, um, uh, being a constituent of your district, I, I've seen some of that change of uh, diversity just around our, our immediate community. Um, and it's becoming more and more necessary to uh, bring in those different groups uh, to represent uh, the, uh, the district well. Um, um, and so that's, that's, that's great to hear that you are uh, bringing those individuals in. Um, uh, along the lines of diversity, you and I have talked briefly in the past, and um, again, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to, to have that conversation in brief. And uh, I know we're not gonna get down to, the, to uh, the fine points today, but would like to bring up again um, the uh, issues we're, we're seeing with refugees coming into our, our city. Um, we're, we've welcomed in historically um, more refugees than, than many places in the world. And I, I, I believe uh, convicted that that is one reason why Houston is, is as great as it is currently. However, um, we have to mention that uh, recently President Trump has once again lowered the refugee cap um, for the United States to an all-time low down to 15,000 for next year. Um, earlier this year, Governor Abbott um, sought to refuse refugees altogether uh, in Texas. Um, so how will you continue um, to meet the needs of existing refugees that currently live in our state, um, as well as the asylum community that currently live in our state, but at the same time seek to uh, open the doors for um, those two groups? Chris, uh, yeah. Before before Tom uh, answers, could you mention just briefly in a couple sentences what Houston Northwest Church is doing? Sure. So not only Houston Northwest, but a number of other churches uh, are partnering with um, a, a ministries and nonprofits that uh, seek to serve uh, and come alongside uh, refugees that have come into Houston that um, may not necessarily represent our faith or represent our, our immediate um, uh, cultures that are represented here at the church, um, or even in our immediate geographic area. Majority of refugees are living in, in Southwest Houston um, for, for a number of reasons. However, um, it is our, our belief, according to scripture, that we are to be our brother's keeper, um, regardless of where they are from or their, their background, but we are to defend the foreigner uh, as well as uh, protect those that um, that may have uh, been born here. Um, so that's that's an important thing for us, um, and we are we're thankful that the um, community around us continues to grow uh, in diversity. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, you know, Chris, I, I admire the work that you do, and uh, I, I would just say that you know our our country is a nation of immigrants. Uh, and I think one of the best things about the United States through the, the centuries, through the decades, um, is that we do rise to the occasion. And when people are being persecuted around the country for political, religious, ethnic reasons, or reasons um, our country, our state, uh, we open our doors and we prioritize those, you know, protecting those folks and giving those folks an opportunity. I think it's one of the literally one of the best things about this nation and uh, and who we are as a people um, is that you know not only are we a nation of immigrants but but we give preferential treatment if you will to people who are truly being oppressed around the world not and and not only do we welcome them into our country but we're a country that's willing to go to war even sometimes around the country on behalf of oppressed peoples right. Um, and we'll take strong stands. I mean, you, you may be aware, I'm sure you are right now, that you know our, our federal government uh, at risk to its own best interests as far as trade with powerful foreign adversaries, uh, several of our members here in Texas have weighed in very strongly on the Chinese, on the Chinese government's treatment of the Uyghurs. Um, classic example right there. You know, it's an ethnic persecution uh, happening abroad. And are we sitting idly by? No, we are not. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's definitely about welcoming refugees. I, in my opinion, uh, refugees are always welcome. Um, and I think it goes even deeper than that. I think our country is a country that, and our people are a people that 
we're willing to fight for the cause of liberty and justice for all, even outside of our borders. We're willing to take that fight to the enemy, uh, whoever that is. And I think that's one of the things that I love most about being an American is that, you know, people sometimes criticize and say, well, you know, you shouldn't be the world's policeman. Well, no, I'm sorry. But if you're going to claim to be the city on a hill, if you're going to be a beacon uh, for others, you have to be willing to stand up and fight against oppression where you see oppression, even if that's not at home. It's certainly if it is at home, you should be. But even if it's abroad, you should be willing to. If you're going to claim to be the world's leader, um, which I know many of us like to think that the United States is a leader of, of nations among the nations, we've got to be willing to go out there and go toe to toe with those who oppress their own people. And and, and speaking of uh, oppression, Tom, we're seeing in, in shifting gears, um, we're seeing an unprecedented amount of churches, synagogues, and mosques, mosques forming coalitions and working groups for this upcoming Texas legislative session, specifically around the issue of child separation. Um, the amount of calls that we've been on with churches that we've never worked with before or who may never have engaged us in conversation before is, it's unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And in light of general, in light of AG Jeff Sessions comments regarding separating children, um, I would say we as people of faith find it morally wrong to separate mother from child, to separate father from child, um, which is why we're concerned about the current state of family separation in Texas. Um, our great state of Texas hosts ICE facilities that have contributed to family separation. At least 2,600 immigrant children are in prison or put in cages in for-profit institutions and are separated from their parents or caregivers. Um, while ICE is part of the federal branch of government, um, what is something that we as faith, we as the faithful in the state of Texas, what can we do to disrupt this process or what can we do to keep our, keep these families together? Well, I think, you know, calling attention to it and, and coming together as people of faith and saying, you know, we, we the family unit is the basic fundamental gift from God um, that it is, you know, children are a blessing from God. Uh, and so, I mean, there's nothing more fundamental than a mother, uh, you know, wanting to protect her child. Um, the, the, the issue of, of what's going on in the border is, of course, complicated by the fact that there's also human trafficking going on, right? And so uh, Houston is a hotbed for that. Uh, and so it, it is not unheard of. Um, and I know you've heard these stories, too, that, that people uh, have their, uh, you know, have their children um, brought to this country. Uh, by somebody else uh, on good faith that, you know, that will give them a better life and then find out that that person ends up uh, being exploited as a child. And I think a society of, of religiously minded people like us uh, who care about human dignity, uh, in addition to child separation, we have to be clear that these are, in fact, their parents uh, and that this is not some attempt to cross the border with a child that is not your own and then have that child wind up being the victim of sex trafficking. So I just want to be super clear that we're, we're divining correctly, you know, as King Solomon was, was wise and was able to divine many things correctly, you know, we need to be wise in how we do this. It's not all one or the other, right? You can't throw everybody into one category and say, well, they're all, you know, every person that crosses the border with a minor uh, is that person's legitimate parent and should never be separated. We know that's not true. Um, but on the other hand, we have to do everything in our power to make sure that those families are not separated. Hmm. Are, would we be able to tell our faith partners that this, was be, this would be part of Dr. Oliverson's agenda to ensure that the godly unit of mother and child or father and child is... I always get in trouble when I don't say father, by the way. So mother, father, and child... Are, are, are kept together um, in a balanced way? Is, would this be part of your agenda? Sharik, I'm all for keeping the family unit together. I am. But again, I, I stress that on the other hand, um, I am a passionate crusader against human trafficking. Um, I can think of, I, I personally believe, and you may disagree with me, 
I, I personally can think that that being uh, being a sex slave uh, is a fate worse than death. I mean, to take to rob someone of their basic human dignity in that way, and to oppress them by forcing them uh, into that kind of a life um, is just literally the lowest of the low. Uh, and so both issues are deeply concerning to me. Thank you. And as we, uh, as we kind of switch gears once again, um, I had an opportunity to meet your opponent yesterday for the first time and was able to listen to his thoughts and um, listening to yours as well. Um, even though you guys may have difference of opinion um, and uh, on different policy topics, um, the question I'd like to ask you that I asked him yesterday um, is, tell me something you value about him. What is something you like about your opponent? And um, it, it's not to, uh, to swing voters one way or another, but um, as we uh, just think along how politics have become so partisan, how things have become so uh, uh, difficult to uh, see eye to eye on, um, even in light of difference, can you just kind of maybe share something that you know about him that you, you value? Sure. Yeah. And so let me be clear about one thing. And that is that Brian and Henry and I have never met, um, personally. And, uh, you know, we've, we've sort of seen each other on Facebook and Twitter and social media. Um, so I don't know him personally. Um, but oddly enough, uh, we have a connection. Uh, and that is, we both, I believe we both graduated from Kingwood High School, although I, I graduated in 1990 and I'm under the impression that he might have graduated sometime after that. Yeah, um, he mentioned that yesterday. And he, yeah, uh, so, which I think is interesting. Uh, Kingwood's Kingwood. a great school. I can't say enough good things about Kingwood, Kingwood High. It was a great, was a great school. Um, look, I appreciate uh, Brian's passion. Um, I appreciate uh, that he is an intelligent, uh, well thought out, a person who cares deeply about public education. Uh, that's very clear. Um, he is a family man. I've seen pictures of him with his daughter where he's reading books. And as a father, I greatly admire uh, any man uh, who takes his family life so seriously that he takes time to point out to the world how important that is. Uh, and I think that's great. I think that's a, that's a foundational role uh, in, in our society and also in my religious beliefs, um, that the role of father is an incredibly important uh, gift and an incredibly important responsibility. Uh, and so, you know, I think he and I are kindred spirits on that. We both love our families and we both want what's best for them. And, uh, you know, I, I think ultimately that the voters will, will make the, the right decision and we'll let them decide what that decision is. And I'd like to wrap up our conversation that you've just been so generous with in your time um, with one last question. How does your faith uh, drive your decision-making process? Well, that's a great question. And that probably is the question, Sharik. And, and you and I've talked about this a couple of times, um, but for the benefit of everybody, you know, I, I, I'm not unapologetic about the fact that I believe that public service uh, from my perspective is a calling. It is a mission field. Um, you are serving your fellow man. You are doing God's will by serving your fellow man. Uh, and that is how I look at it. Uh, and I'm, I'm unabashed about that. And, and uh, that, that is how I believe this whole thing came to be. Uh, this was God's will. And, uh, you know, and by that, I don't mean that, you know, um, uh, I, I, my, role is supreme to anyone, except that I think that God has a plan for each of us. And the best possible course of action for any human being is to be in the center of God's will for your life. Uh, and that's how I look at public service. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Dr. Oliverson, for your time today. My name is Sharik Abdul Ghani. I am the director of Minaret Foundation, where our focus is to lift American Muslim voices for sustainable change through multi-faith and civic engagement. Today, I'm joined by Pastor Chris Hall, who's uh, responsible for outreach and the missions director for Houston Northwest Church. Thank you, Chris, for joining us today. And of course, Dr. Oliverson running for District 130. And if you wanna learn more about Dr. Oliverson, his website is right below, tomoliverson.com. He's responsive to the questions through email, and you might even get a personal phone call like Chris did before as well. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Oliverson. Thank you for joining us today. 
and God bless you all.